Welcome everybody. I see friends and, and familiar names in, in this Zoom. So I'm so excited that you're with me today. We're gonna be talking about a topic that I have really come to love. I'm calling this Reclaiming Our African Roots and I may at the end kind of talk a little bit more about what that means. But really I'm gonna be focusing on Family Search's efforts to preserve oral genealogies in Africa. As you know, my name is Tom Reed. And I am a Deputy Chief Genealogical Officer with Family Search. And I'd like to start off with a video, and a video that kind of illustrates the, the whole thing I'm going to be talking about the rest of, of, of this afternoon's presentation. Oh, no, 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 so this is obviously a, a, a video of our oral genealogy collection process. This is actually, um, I don't understand the language, <laughs> but he, the, the chief is talking about how we're going to be writing things down and documenting and, and just asking some clarifying questions as we do a village entry. And so oh, one of the oh, questions oh, that they oh, ask is, are you connected to a tribe? Do you know your own African heritage? Are you able to reclaim your roots back to the continent of Africa? Are you of the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, for example, or the Igbo people? of Nigeria, or maybe you have a connection like I do to the Congo people of DR Congo or the Luo tribe of Kenya, the Ewe people of Togo, or the Busoga tribe of Uganda. All of these and many tribes, most tribes and, and, and ethnic groups across the continent of Africa have a deep ancestral memory, but that memory does tend to fade over time. And so at Family Search, preserving oral genealogy on the African continent is the fulfillment of the biblical phrase, maybe some of you are familiar with, to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. And why, why do we do this, really? Because, especially in Africa, because we know that over half of the children in the sub-Saharan continent of Africa have no birth record. According to UNICEF in December of 2017, the births of around 95 million children under the age of five, which is slightly more than half, have never been recorded. And in most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, natural registrations of births, marriages, and deaths began only recently, and now only documents about a fraction of these vital events. The director of the civil registration in Tanzania told the author of a study, of that UNICEF study, that 18% of births are now documented by the government, which is a great improvement over previous years, but the documented children live primarily in just one town and that's in, in Dar al Salaam, the capital city of Tanzania. And so with few exceptions, national censuses are either non-existent, they're destroyed, or they name people only from select segments of the population. Family Search has been seeking to digitally preserve all nominal censuses in sub-Saharan Africa, but most extant censuses are really just recent records. And so, for example, I'll kind of share with you you know, in DR Congo, we, we are making the effort to preserve oral genealogy for several generations, but we've also been able to digitize Catholic parish reg registers that go, that started in the 1890s and national identity applications that are from the 1920s, for example. We've also been able to digitize the entire 1984 national census and are in the process of publishing that because it contains information on lots of living people being such a, a recent census, the publication, it may take a while for us to be able to actually publish that. But we also have civil registrations from the 1990s. So if you see, we, there are paper records that are there, but they only cover this span of about 100 years. If you're going from the 1990s with, with more current or more recent civil registrations down to Catholic parish registers that we've been able to collect from the 1890s, but there's a much richer heritage. There's a much deeper tradition and stories. And the oral traditions in Africa are deep. We know they're transmitted, many of you know, they're transmitted by word of mouth. They're like 100, this 122-year-old informant in Benin 
from 2018. She's the one that actually is, is able to document and, and share the story of her people. And it really gives uni unification and strength to that people. Some of the aspects of that oral tradition will include things like folk tales and proverbs, chants, even stories of heroes. We hear a lot of time about the first ancestor or you know, significant um, um, battles that happened or clashes and, and how people uh, you know, perform these heroic events as we get these oral traditions. They give these narrative histories and take us on a timeline from the, the origination of that village or of that people to the current day. They even give us those origin stories, for example, as well. And of course, we are in it because of the genealogies, because we know there's power in oral genealogy. In many instances, this becomes generations before written records, and it provides evidence of things like family relationships. So who is documented, who actually is related to who, and things like moral character. You know, things are documented in those oral stories that talk about, like I said, the, the heroics and the people who were part of, of the founding of these people. Um, you'll find out that people use these oral genealogies for suitability for marriage. Um, just making sure you come from the right family is, is, is a tradition that exists among many peoples in the African continent. Also legal inheritance statuses. So if you have the right to a certain property or you have a right to, to chieftaincy, um, that can be documented through the power of oral genealogy, including like the right to rule, for example. And in many instances, the, this oral, the oral genealogy and the power behind it establish order and norms, but they also keep the people connected. And that's at Family Search something that we want to accomplish is we, we want to connect and document the family tree of all humankind. And oral genealogies are just one way. Now, this is kind of an interesting photo that I've left up here on this. This informant claimed to be 200 years of age in Ghana in 2018. I don't know, but, but we know, obviously, with written records, there's some inaccuracies, and we understand that happens in oral genealogy, too. But there's a lot of power and richness that come from these oral stories. Here's an interesting story. I, I, this picture doesn't do it justice because this photo was taken quite a long, long time ago. But there are many, like this man, who is considered a griot, a, a village rememberer, if you will, who has a deep memory of family history. And so his name is Opanin Kwame Nketia. And he was 86 years old at the time that our uh, group went to Ghana to, to record the oral history among his people. And he was extremely receptive. He could remember 10 generations and there were 780 descendants on the tree he recited. That, that is kind of typical in some instances. And, and you know, we, we've, we've run into lots of people like, um, like Open and who, who have these deep memories and rich, and, and, and it's in their mind. I mean, that's just amazing to remember 700 descendants and how they are linked. Right, And they visited him in order to get all that down. They sat down with him and visited him four times before they actually were able to complete his work. And the fifth time they went back to visit him just to say thank you. And when they arrived, they were told that he had died peacefully in his sleep and the evening that the work was completed. He was able to document these 780 descendants, these 10 generations of his people, and then died. Many of you are familiar with this African proverb, when an old man dies, a library burns to the ground, right? And so we feel a sense of duty because of stories like Open and, and, and others to collect this oral history as quickly as we can. And so we've engaged in, in a massive effort to do that. And I'd like to show with you, share with you just a little video that previews just a little bit of what we're doing and why we're trying to do this, this video was produced a few years ago. So since then we've made significant progress and I'll share that progress with you. But in this video, you'll, you'll understand more about why we do what we do and what we're hoping to accomplish.
for centuries, African people, they were tied to the oral traditions. People were preserving their family history that way, from one generation to another one. The old men in the villages can tell us about seven generations without any problem. And this part of our country, keeping records on paper is not a norm. Keeping records are important, so we'll do that for our kids. But for our forefathers, they didn't do that. So the only way for us to get information from them is if you go and they are not dead, you'll be lucky, but if you are dead, it's a big problem. So this is what Family Search is doing. We are interviewing the, the chief of the village, we are interviewing the chief of clans, we are interviewing the chief of tribe or families because these people are the ones that kept the family information. You know, people actually are dying when they reach, let's say, 60, between 60 to 65 years old. When you think about what there is to collect across the Africa, so the oral genealogy in Africa is maybe 250 million names to collect is what we've estimated that would have been available to family search across multiple countries today. This year we'll collect 1.3 million names. 1.3 million, we got 250 million to collect. The math says we better get busy in a hurry. If we wait five years, they'll all be gone. Anything that we can do to get those people somehow, some way, in a particular record to show that they existed, must be done. And it must be done now. So we've undertaken a massive effort, as you can see from that video, with our oral genealogy program. And we have a focus that started in 2018, where you saw that we were at 1.3 million names that we've collected. We are collecting oral genealogies and oral histories in 15 African nations. I'll show you where those are in, in just a moment. By the time this is done, we will have collected over 700,000 interviews, 700,000. We'll have 2.1 million photos with GPS coordinates. And we'll have over 7,000 audio files. Again, our goal is to be able to document 250 million people. That's what we're trying to accomplish over the next few years. And so our oral genealogy program has been, and, and, and because of COVID restrictions, there are some places where we currently are actively um, um, doing our oral genealogy collections, but you see countries as far, you know, west as Sierra Leone, going east all the way to Kenya and Central Africa and DR Congo and Angola, and then down in southern, in South Africa with South Africa and Zimbabwe. The, these are the countries where we have done this, mostly because of existing relationships that we have through governments and with the various ethnic groups and nations that we've been able to establish relationships with. Um, and we hope that at some point we might be able to expand into other countries. But right now we're, we're focused on these uh, 15 nations. And we've, it, it's been a joy to be able to interview people from all over. We've interviewed people obviously in Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, and Uganda, and here are their faces. Here are the beautiful people who are telling their story and, and that they're helping to honor and remember their ancestors. I'll kind of tell you a little bit about the oral genealogy process. And one of the things I, I had the opportunity to go to Africa in 2016, and, and any of you who may know me in the genealogical community might have saw my documentation of Tom and Ghana, where I went and, and one of the things we were able to catch is capture his photos, beautiful photos like this, and document the process as we were looking to ramp up this effort. 
we've been actually collecting oral histories in uh, Africa since the 90s, but it's only been in recent years that we've really made this concerted effort, this race against time, if you will. And so being able to document the process and prepare many, many organizations and groups to help us was, was the reason why I went to, to Ghana back in 2016. The process for us is, is kind of simply, we obtain guidance and permission from village leaders. And that may take quite a, little, quite a lot of um, time to do that. That's not something where you just walk into the village and say, hey, we're here to collect your oral histories. We really have to work through the various uh, structures of leadership among the ethnic groups and the tribes and the chiefs and, and work our way to eventually get this guidance from the village leader on who to interview. So we'll meet with the, the head of the clan or those who know the ancestry and explain the process and what we're going to do with them. We'll obtain the interview consent form and take photos. I'll show you the interview consent form here in just a moment, but we'll take photos. We'll take, we always take at least a photo of the, the informant or the interviewee. Uh, we'll take a picture of their extended family if they, if they, again, all these are according to their permissions and their traditions. Um, we'll take an extended family and we like to also take a picture of the region or the area or the village or their home or something that represents the place. But all of these have GPS coordinates tagged to them so that we might be able to go back in the future and, and again, talk to these people that we've interviewed. Um, we document in right off the bat, the document, the tribe, the clan, the village, the language and the GPS coordinates. I'll actually have an opportunity a little bit in, in further in the presentation to show you what this looks like on family search. We also um, record audio of their origin story. So every, every interview we do is recorded on audio as well. So like, I, like you saw on the previous slide, we are capturing languages that may be extinct in 30 years because we're capturing all these audio files and in this native in the native tongue of these people. And we write the details of the first generation life event. So we do write kind of the history as we, as we can, as, as good as we can document it, but we also recite back to the interviewer the, for accuracy, the names of all, the, all those we record. And so we repeat these steps for six and seven in terms of writing the details of life events and, and reciting that back to the interviewer and the informant. Um, for all the descendant families. We may, again, meet that head of clan who says you need to meet with this family, this family, and that family to gather all the information for a specific village, right? So this is kind of the process, and this is why I went actually to Africa, was to document this process. And so here is the process and how it works. I've had many people who've come up to me and said, oh, I'd love to help with this. You know, I, I you know, have lived in Ghana for, for 13 years, and and did work there and things like that, I'd love to go back. Well, we we actually have our, our working family search contracts with various companies who actually are native, who have local language ability, who know local customs, who know, um, who, who know exactly, uh, um, you know, what's, what are the traditions? What are the things that, that they need to follow? And so here, for example, is in Zimbabwe, we, Zimbabwe, we've trained the field agents or the organization that's sending out interviewers and things like that. Um, and here's some training of field agents in Nigeria. We employ women as well as men that can go and do this work. And we have many, um, we're actually employing, for example, many companies um, and helping to, to employ because they're, they're getting paid to actually do this work. And then you see here in Ghana, we have a, this huge training that we put together for all these genealogy collectors. They will go out and they will spend a, a, you know, a few days sometimes or, or you know, sometimes a week in a village to collect and document all this history, right? It, it's not glamorous. <laughs> um, it's difficult work. And that's why we employ those locals who, who know the customs, who, who are acclimated, who know the language because it's important. But they might have some challenges like this, like just getting to the interview. For example, this car in, in Liberia, or you know, here is another person who's you know, taking all his materials 
and having to walk across a log in order to get to the village to actually do the interview with the village remember, with the person that they need to meet, right? That this isn't, this is difficult work, <laughs> um, but it's also rewarding. Here's an opportunity I had to meet when we did village entry. There's kind of the custom when you come into a village is to do a ceremony with those who are the chiefs and leaders in this particular um, village in, in Abra Obohan, this is, uh, this, there's a woman who is the chief of these people in this village. And we sit down with the chiefs and kind of explain everything that's going on. And like I told you earlier, we also have um, village leaders that we sit down with. You see these two women in blue are the contractors who actually, um, who are the ones that will be coordinating the interview efforts. And they sit down and, and they make sure they get consent. They make sure everyone in the village knows what's going on. They get the direction of who they're going to go visit. And then they, they're they able to put together things like this consent form. So this interviewer, Emmanuel Forster, is, is a gentleman I actually met when I was there. And this is one of the, the identification sheets that we use to record by hand, right? And so we have, for example, the age of, of here, Olivia Sedu, who is the informant. And we have her tribe. She is from the Guan tribe of the Atadua clan in, and speaks the Siu language. I've never heard of this language. In, in, and I, I should have actually, that's, that makes sense. I should have gone back and actually listened to this interview because I can listen to this interview. But it, she was able to recite 295 names in seven generations. And it took six hours of recording all of this it may have been done over the course of two or three days because we, we'd like to be very cognizant and understand that many live in an agricultural area and have to go work. And so we might meet with them at the end of their work day or at the beginning before they head off to the fields to do work. And so this may involve multiple days, even though it's six hours to get to collect all this history. It, it's really rich. This specific one, I love the, the, this one because I was able to go back and look, like I said, at the GPS coordinates. This was the village was Akpapu Odimi in Ghana, near kind of modern day where, where the lines are for Togo. And this is a, a satellite image of this actual village of what it looks like today from the sky. I was not there personally, but, but I think it's awesome that we're able to see where these people are congregated and where these interviews take place and be able to pinpoint these people and, and their history all here. I told you earlier that we collect origin stories in audio as part of the process. And here's a gentleman, Debake George, and I want you to just listen to him tell his story. Now, it may be you can hear the interviewer a little bit more than you can hear Debake George, but hopefully you'll be able to capture and just get an essence of what it's like to, to participate in this. Hello, good morning. This is Nongna Poza. Today is 24th of June, 2018. I'm doing an interview with Mr. Dabaki George at Dukwam Residential Area. We will now start the interview in English. Ready? Good morning once again. Good morning. Mm. Uh, please, Daddy, what is your name? Dabake George. Uh, My name is Dabake George. Dabake George. Uh, uh, Daddy, which clan do you belong to? I'm a Ziggler by Ziggler. Uh, by the Busanga clan. Uh, Ziggler by the Busanga clan. Please, may you give us uh, a brief history about maybe where you were born? Okay, I was born in a village called Kulungungu. Kulungungu. Seven miles away from Boko. Seven miles away from Boko. And on the border between Ghana and Burkina Faso. Okay. And that was, mm -hmm. I was and that was in the year nineteen forty six. So it means you were born in nineteen forty six. Daddy, may you take us 
Okay, so if you were able to pick up on that, here's Debake George talking about where he was born in Kulungungu. And it was seven miles from another city. I couldn't capture the actual city, but he also tells what clan and what tribe he is a member of and when he was born. And he and you might have caught that he says it's on the border of Burkina Faso, right? And so we we are able to capture these level of details. And Debake George will appear a little bit later in this presentation, and, and I'll be able to show you some interesting things from, from what we were able to do with him. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the oral genealogy process and collection requires us to sit down, and we also transcribe right by hand, as well as capture audio, what's being recited to us. And so here you see in Ghana, where one of our interviewers is sitting down with an informant and writing down on a piece of paper exactly what you know the history that's being told to him the next slide is a video that actually share, shows us a little bit more in detail so you see here you might not have been able to hear or anything clearly but you'll see he's been documenting the names that have been told to him and so it comes out on a form that looks like this where we have we do the, the consent form on one side and gather all the details, and then we start adding things like the informant, and then we start being able to document a generation. So we see the first generation, the second generation, the third generation, and on and on and on as we capture this. And we take these forms, and then we do data entry. So we go back to a place where, where we're able to actually look. You can see on the table these um, the forms that are there, and they're being typed and entered, and they're being able to be created into kind of lineage-linked files so that family groups are kept together. This is women doing in Nigeria. This is also data entry collection process in Nigeria with, with the men. And what we're trying to do is we want to create a book for the family, for the tribe, for the village. And so we'll go back after we've added all this to the database and put these families together, and we'll go verify the, you know, and, and make sure it, it's all accurate and present it to the informant. Here's one in Nigeria. Here's another presentation of genealogy to, to the informant in Cameroon. And so they get an actual hard copy. And for many, this is this is priceless because like we we heard earlier, Somebody may actually, you know, who gave this information may pass away in five years. And we know that many young folks are leaving their villages and, and not retaining this information. So to have it written down, to have a book, we give them a book. We typically give the, um, the head of the, the, the village, the clan, uh, or whatever, the ethnic group, whatever they desire, we will give them copies so that they have it. We will back it up on, on disks and make and redundant copies and also we want to make sure that it's digitized for the world. And so although we've done a, a lot of collection up until now, not everything um, has been published, but much has been published on FamilySearch.org. And hopefully many of you are familiar with FamilySearch.org, a free family history website um, sponsored by FamilySearch, my, my organization. And we actually have a way that you can connect with these genealogies once they're published. So in this case, I'm going to show you Debake George's. Remember, he he shared his origin story. Well, let's search for him, so to speak. So on Family Search, under our genealogies, you can click on it. You don't even have to sign up and and get a free you a Family Search account in order to look at these to start. But you can sign in, or you can uh, search here, click on genealogies, and it will take you to the search genealogies page. In this case, we have various search features, but in this case, I only entered Debake George, and I was able to click search, which then took me to this page. Within our oral histories, I'm able to see Debake George, who was born 
And they went and talked, I think, a little bit more and found out that his birth date was actually around 1939 in Kulungugu um, in Ghana, right? And so they clicked on here. If you click on here, we'll be able to see more details about this interview. We'll be able to see the family tree that was recorded. In this case, Dabake George was able to name his grandparents on his father's side um, and, and his mother's side. That's as far as this tree goes uh, uh, for Dabake George. But you see, we, we've captured a lot of information at the top as well. And, and as you click more, for example, you'll see even more. Remember he said he was from the tribe of Busanga and he was of the clan Zila. I didn't catch that's what it was, but that was the, the clan. And I told you earlier that when we go to a village and when we meet with an interviewer, we always, we capture the audio as many times as we need to, and we take pictures of the interviewer, their extended family, and of the environment. And so in this case, in Dabake George, we can actually see this picture of the extended family. This is a family search memory. Family search provides the, the ability for you to add photos and stories of your ancestors. And these are automatically, when we upload them as genealogies, added to memories as well. So individuals can see. And so this is Dabake George's family. And, and it's just, it's so, I don't know what, how to say, it's so rewarding to be that we have captured this that we're documenting these living people right now who may be deceased in 10, 20, 30 years, right? And we're able to capture this history. Like I said earlier, pres preserving African oral genealogy is about turning the hearts of the children to their fathers. It's in many instances, the most comprehensive genealogical record that we can find. It reaches back to the original settlers of each village. And in many cases provides audio files for, as we collect, and we, it will probably be more than a thousand indigenous languages. It also has photos of the informants and their families with GPS. In this case, may be the only record for hundreds of millions of people. And so we are trying desperately, as you saw earlier in the video, to reclaim these African roots.